answering questions. So I would be happy to entertain as many questions as you might have here. Yeah, questions from the middle. The red shirt, yeah. So how do you recharge the quadcopter? Yeah, so the question is how do you recharge it? The quadcopter that you got for Christmas or something, right? You gotta plug it in because it'll play five to fly for three minutes. Okay. So this nuclear battery on the back is uh, has um, uh, plutonium-238, which is a non-bond grade material, but it is a radioactive material in it. And that material has a half-life of 88 years. So it can continue providing power for decades. However, it only provides about 100 watts of power, like quite a bit less than this light. And so what we do is Titan, um, like our own moon, spins <coughs> slow enough that it always has the same face toward its parent planet. So it takes Titan 16 Earth days to rotate. And during those eight Earth days of Titan night, you're also on the far side from the Earth, we can't communicate with it. So we essentially have a, a large regular battery, a conventional battery inside. And during the Titan night, we use the nuclear battery to charge the chemical battery. And then we run all the operations during Titan's day off the chemical battery. And then once night comes again, we're able to recharge it up again. So it's really this, nuclear battery power source that's enabling the whole thing to work because solar power at the surface of Titan is actually a thousand times less effective than on the surface. Uh, on Titan, it's a thousand times less effective than on Earth. So if you want to power the solar panels, you need like tennis courts or something uh, that we can't afford to bring. So it's really the nuclear battery that provides that power. Yeah, so the suggestion is since there's liquid water on Titan, there should be stuff living under there, right? Well. We don't know how that works on other planets. That's true on Earth, but is that true on other planets? We haven't tested it yet. We'd love to test it, and this is one of our chances to do it. I was at a very interesting meeting with a bunch of Earth oceanographers, including Robert Ballard, who was the guy who discovered the Titanic. And we were, as planetary people, we were talking to these Earth ocean people. And they were like, oh yeah, we sure you're gonna find something there. We find things all over on Earth. And I'm like, I don't think it's necessarily the same. If you're on a different planet, we might not have had the same processes that formed life, but we might have. And the, the real answer is we don't know, and we need to go there and find out. Yeah, good question. So the question is, can we control it? Well, uh, Saturn is about 80 light minutes away. So we can't really joystick this thing. It's gotta entirely be autonomous and do the whole entry on itself. So the entire entry, descent, and landing sequence lasts about two hours. And so basically, that's all gonna be long done by the time we actually hear about it. We'll be hearing about it, stuff that happened an hour and a half ago, and we hope that the computer programs we put in there pull off the landing, but we're not really gonna know uh, until we find out and the, and the radio waves get back to us. So that's gonna be really nerve wracking. Um, the Mars landings have to go through Mars's very thin atmosphere, and they land very quickly. It takes about seven minutes. And the JPL engineers call it the seven minutes of terror. So with our thick atmosphere on Titan and the, th and the low gravity, it takes us about two hours to land. So we're gonna have 120 minutes of mild concern, but I still think I'm gonna be pretty nervous, right? Um, when we've been working on this for 20 years, we've spent all this effort on it um, and making sure we don't know whether it's survived to down to the surface yet. It's gonna, be, it's gonna be very exciting time, let's put it that way. So the question is, are we aiming for self crater? We are aiming for the area next to Salt Crater. And the reason for that is our landing ellipse is about this big, and we don't want to accidentally land, you know, on the crater rim where there's like, you know, cliffs and very rough material. So we are going to land down here in these, you can see some of the lines. These are the sand dunes south of the crater. This is gonna be our target landing ellipse. It's about this size. Uh, we don't know what the winds are gonna be like on Titan that day, and so there's some uncertainty into where we'll come down. We want to make sure that no matter where we come down, we will be within the dunes and the interdunes where we can find a safe place to land. Uh, and so we'll start down here, and then over the course of those three years and four months of our mission, we will be hiking, uh, doing these one flight every month, getting closer and closer to the crater until we can get down to that previously liquid impact melt material that we can measure at the bottom. Who's doing the software? Um, this is all, the software for this is being uh, written at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory in Maryland. They're the ones that are building the vehicle. Um, so the Applied Physics Laboratory um, does several space missions. They flew the Pluto mission um, that flew a couple years ago. Uh, they flew on the missions to Mercury. They just flew this DART mission that crashed into an asteroid to demonstrate uh, its ability to deflect an asteroid. 
Um, but APL is primarily a defense organization. They do a bunch of, do, of work for the Navy, and their planetary part is quite small. Um, but so the, the entirety of APL will be contributing to our software. Um, but planning and testing is a critical part of our process. So we actually have a vehicle right now that uh, we're using doing tests with. It doesn't have the final software, but as we get new software, we introduce it and we fly it on Earth, um, where we can't simulate the full conditions at Titan. But for instance, we can't, we, because it's harder to fly on Earth, we can't um, build a vehicle as massive as ours and fly it on Earth, but we can build a vehicle that weighs the same. Right? So we build a vehicle that's seven times less massive. It has the same weight it will have on Titan, and we can do similar tests. So we've been running active tests. We will continue to do those tests because software is an absolutely critical component to our ability to fly and to navigate autonomously uh, that far from Earth. How deep can we drill? Drilling on planets turns out to be real hard. Uh, the Apollo astronauts got several struck drill, stuck drill bits, and uh, there's the eternal problem of that it's very easy with a relatively small lander to turn a drill into something that's just going to turn you around in a circle. Um, so we are drilling a total of 10 centimeters deep. So the goal of the drill is actually to just get past this crust that we think might be on top of the Titan materials that comes from the atmospheric gook that's coming down. Uh, and, that's, and both that and to be able to turn those solid um, ice rocks into small enough particles that we can suck in with our vacuum cleaner. Um, but it's not, we're not going down very far, unfortunately. Like, it's 100 kilometers down to the ocean. We'd love to get down that far, but we're, we're going down 10 centimeters instead. <laughs> yeah, great question. So the question is, Titan's mostly made of water, but is it water all the way down, or is there some rock down there? Um, by looking at the gravity field of Titan and its overall density, we do know that we think it's ice on the surface, and then there's liquid water, there may be an ice layer below that. Ice that you know floats, but it turns out if you really pressurize ice enough, you can get higher pressure forms of ice. There might be a different chemical structure of ice at the bottom. And below that, we do think there is a rocky mantle and then an iron core at the bottom. But we hope that we, our seismometer is able to detect titan quakes, because if we detect titan quakes, we'll be able to probe this entire interior structure based on what kind of waves propagate through and what their intensity are. Um, but there have to be sources, right? There have to be enough Titan quakes for us to do that. So if there are, we'll be able to know that for sure um, by the time we get there. Uh, so we hope to be able to do that. Yeah, so the great question. How do we, well, after we've landed, once we're hopping along, how do we, how do we know where to land? Uh, that very first landing has to be totally LIDAR because we're not gonna know what's going on. But after that first landing, we have the freedom to be able to scout our future landing sites. So actually what we do is, uh, we fly out two-thirds of our range, okay, we fly around, we take pictures from the air, and then we fly back one-third of our range and land. And then we're going to do that again. We fly out two-thirds of our range, scout the next landing site, and then we land at the site that we just scouted. So we call this the leapfrog strategy. So every landing site after the first one will be at a site that we have pre-scouted, and the engineers will tell us they want to land on the flattest, safest parking lot, and the scientists will say, we want to land on this canyon! And then we'll find some compromise and we'll find a place to land and we'll use mostly optical navigation actually pictures from the last flight to be able to get us back to the exact site that we picked um, for the next landing what is dragonfly made out of good question um, the exterior skeleton is made of aluminum but uh, we're trying to incorporate more magnesium into the structure because we really need to get the weight down okay we're a little overweight so we need to get uh, the overall mass of the vehicle down and magnesium is a little less massive but a lot of the volume inside it is actually styrofoam. There's this 90 Kelvin super cold air outside, and then we have to keep all of our computers and electronics and batteries at room temperature-ish on the inside, uh, and so there's really this, this foam that's like, it's like really thick um, that's insulating most of the way around to be able to keep us um, at a good temperature on, on the inside. Um, the way we keep that temperature is we have this hot uh, nuclear battery back here, and um, we used to have this complicated uh, system of, of fluid loop that would keep everything warm, and now we just have fans because there's air on Titan, right? So you can like do that. <laughs> this is not something we're used to doing on spacecraft, okay? Just like putting a fan in for cooling, but that's the way we are, we're able to do it because we're able to use that atmosphere. Um, yeah, the question is, could you jump up and flap your arms and make your own airplane? We think yes, 
we think that the gravity is low enough and the air is thick enough that if you were in a dome, say, right, on Titan, and you had some big wing, you could actually flap your own wings and fly within that dome. I mean, don't go outside because you'll freeze to death. But inside there, inside the warm air, air, with that low gravity, it's so easy to fly that we think even you could fly there. Yep. So what is the range? How far can it fly? Uh, great question. The answer is it really depends sensitively on what our final mass is and how big our final battery is and what our final efficiency is. Um, and so all these numbers are up in the air. The bottom line is something between four and 10 kilometers in a single hop. And it will depend on the, and how much, how aggressively we want to run the battery down. Right now we don't, we, we have a rule that we ha cannot fly at less than 50% battery. So we're really using only the top of the battery. So as we learn more and get more comfortable, uh, we'll be able to refine that down. But right now it's, uh, so like two to six uh, miles, something like that. Yeah. So the question is, if we have fans, we have ventilation from the outside. Well, the air outside is so cold, if we got any outside air in, we'd be dead. So actually one of the hardest jobs on Dragonfly is the temperature engineering. Because on the surface, when we're sitting there recharging the battery, we don't want to get too cold and have everything freeze, okay? But then when we fly and we're running these rotors and we're running the battery and we're dra draining 1500 watts of power for half an hour, you get really hot. You don't want to get too hot. So we actually have a system where we don't bring in outside air, but we blow air past a window that can get cold. So it's kind of like when you're sleeping at night, okay, if you get too hot, you want to stick a leg out and, and cool off, okay? So we have an active system that will allow us to hopefully stay within this temperature range, both, you know, to huddle up uh, at night when we're trying to stay warm and to then use that cold atmosphere to cool off uh, when we need to dissipate that heat uh, when we're really running the battery hard later on. Yeah, so the question is, do we have to worry about dust? Um, there is dust on Titan. Um, We've seen dust storms, um, and if you, it's particularly when we run our rotors, we might be able to, we might blast some dust uh, out in the atmosphere. It's definitely something we've thought of. However, um, the materials here are very low temperature, cold materials. Uh, and so once you get them on those hot rotors, we don't think they're gonna last very long. Uh, we think we should be able to push that past that. Uh, there is a concern of whether the dust is gonna build up on our camera lenses. Uh, and we have thought about that. We have a special, uh, anti-dust coating on there, but also we kind of fly, right? It helps that when we fly, we're flying at about 20 miles an hour through this thick atmosphere. So we think that's going to help clean off the lenses from dust. So it's something we're thinking about. It's something that we'll be observing scientifically, but it's not something we think is going to be, um, you know, ultimately a, a problem or a driver for the mission. How many hours have we poured into this? Um, well, like I was saying, like there are literally a thousand people. I think we're working over, well over a thousand people. I think there's over 600 FTEs, which meaning it, the equivalent, really it's 1,800 people working for four months, but it's the equivalent of 600 people working nonstop just this year alone, man. So like, this is big, this is a big NASA mission. Um, and it has to, you need all those people because you have to have thought of everything before you go, right? You can't just figure it out on the fly. You can't just figure out, oh, we need to get cooler. Oh, now we, you know, you're melted. You can't send a graduate student out there to tighten a, to tighten a bolt or anything, right? So we have to have thought of everything first. We have to have modeled everything on the computer. We have to have done that active testing on Earth. We have to have tested the system entirely. And so uh, it takes a huge number of people. And once you get that many people working together, you need people to organize them, right? We have really talented managers that know how to make sure that we're gonna get everything done in the right time and have enough extra time so that we can make our launch date and that sort of thing. It is a surprisingly challenging program. It is in fact rocket science. <laughs> so what inspired me to look into Titan other than um, it, it's sort of its, its conditions? Well, um, I really, I'm also very interested in this geology on Titan. Um, the geology of the, uh, the river networks that we see, um, the geology of having liquid seas and uh, oceans. In fact, uh, I and my students back at the University of Idaho were the first ones to discover waves on those seas. Um, I was very excited by that. Um, and I did a bunch of calculations then and showed that the waves have an amplitude of about two centimeters. So <laughs> don't plan your, your, um, uh, your, your surfing vacation just yet. But still, it's kind of exciting that we're able to see these things um, that we've only seen before on Earth in this very exotic, um, otherworldly environment. So those are the kind of things we're going to look for. In fact, I'm really excited about, excited about getting to um, 
the, the, once we get to the crater, I want to like look back at the crater wall because I think you're going to be able to see the geologic rock layers exposed there the same way they're like exposed in the Grand Canyon. You'll be able to read the history, the geologic history of this world by looking at those layers. And that's the kind of thing that we really haven't been able to do before. And this we'll be able to do for the first time. I'm really excited to be able to hopefully get to do that uh, come 2034. Yeah, good question. Are there any concerns with methane um, and the structure of dragonfly? Um, we are landing in the sand dunes, which are the desert, um, and we're landing in the dry season, so we think that it's very unlikely to rain there. Um, although it rains very often on Earth, and although the, although the probability of it raining in Idaho in the spring is about 100% every day. <laughs> um, on Titan, um, well, so does anyone know what fraction of Earth is covered in cloud at any given time? Anyone have a guess? 30%? More than 30%. It's 70%. 70% of Earth is cloudy on any average day. The average amount of cloud cover on Titan is about 2%. There's just not very much sunlight out there to drive, to drive processes. So there's a lot less atmospheric cloud, and there's a lot more probability of rain. In fact, we think on any given spot on Titan, it rains once every 1,000 years. So we think it's very unlikely. The big danger from rain would be the cooling. It would, it would evaporatively cool the vehicle. It might be hard to keep warm. Um, it's because uh, methane is a nonpolar molecule. If you put, uh, you know, if you dump your iPhone in water, it's bad, okay? If you dump your, dump your iPhone in a nonpolar solvent like methane, it's fine. In fact, one of the things they do to fix your phone if, you, if it's been dropped in water is they put it in like acetone or a nonpolar solvent to drive away the water and that nonpolar solvent won't affect the electronics. So we think it's perfectly fine if we were to get liquid methane in there, but the danger would be that it would, it would, it would get too cold, but we think it's very unlikely that'll happen and we think we're in good shape even if it does. So that's a good question. Yeah, so why do we go back to Earth for slick salt instead of Jupiter? Jupiter is a much more effective, effective slingshot. However, it's on the other side of the solar system at this time. Jupiter's orbit is every 12 years, and Saturn's is every 28 years. So it's about every 15 year cycles, Jupiter and Saturn line up that you can use Jupiter. In fact, Cassini did use Jupiter uh, to get a gravity assist, and we totally would have done that, um, but it, it wasn't available. So we had to come back and use Earth instead. Yeah, so certainly, because you can't fix it, we definitely have tried to be designing as many backups as we can. At the same time, we have a cost cap, um, unlike the James Webb Space Telescope, for instance. Um, so we can't just throw an infinite amount of resources at it. We have to pick and choose some things that we are able to build redundantly that will have a backup, and some things that we can't afford, either in terms of mass or money or time, to be able to have a backup for it. Um, so the rocket itself is probably maybe 99%. So, Getting too much above 99% seems like it's probably gilding the lily at some level. So, uh, but this is being able to design something that's very, very likely to survive for this three-year mission we have. This is kind of the problem. I don't, you remember the uh, Mars rovers that they built and launched in 2003 that were designed to last for 90 days and live for 13 years? Because if you want it 99% likely to last for 90 days, it's you know probably 70% likely to last for 10 years, okay? So we're in the same boat where we're designing as many redundancies as we can in the systems that are most likely to fail or the systems that are most likely to be a problem if they do fail. And some of the other systems, um, anything for instance that would fail if it were to fail in flight that would cause us to crash, those all have backups. Anything that might fail on the ground where we could you know, still talk to the vehicle and try to come up with a solution for it, those were more likely to um, have foregone our redundancy um, in favor of trying to save mass and money and power. So it's definitely a very complicated engineering problem to decide which things you need a backup for and which you don't. Uh, and that's something that's ongoing within the team right now. Uh, let me give you an example. We have a navigation camera that's taking those pictures to be able to tell where we're going and to be able to find our way back. And we cut the redundant navigation camera because we're like, yeah, cameras in space really haven't failed. They're pretty proven technology. I mean, when's the last time your iPhone camera failed, okay? It's probably good. But our review panel was very concerned about that. So we may end up putting a, a redundant camera back in in case one camera goes out while we're flying so that we'll be able to still navigate to our next cycle. So that's a, an example of the kind of things we're doing. So Earth sand dunes are kind of um, less interesting, I would say, just because Earth sand dunes are mostly made of rock. Um, however, there are plenty of living things that live in the sand. 
um, and if you've ever been to sand dunes, um, there's a lot of sand on there, but you dig down, there tends to be liquid, uh, you know, wetted areas. There are a lot of bacteria that live in there. Um, and in these dunes I visited in uh, Namibia, in Southwest Africa, there are a surprising amount of, uh, you know, plants and animals, little lizards that live in there, uh, and um, a surprising amount of life uh, within those dunes. If we are able to measure those, the composition of that sand on Titan, what we expect to find instead is sort of the pathways that um, uh, chemicals might go and the chem chemistry might progress toward life. Uh, the way we're going to try to see if there might be life, one of the tricks we're going to use is um, we want to look at the size of those molecules. Um, if just random chemistry is happening, you kind of produce molecules of all different kinds. One of the things we want to look for are what are called um, amino acids, which are the chemical basis for the proteins that form all of the uh, enzymes and the chemicals that are, that are going to make up your body. But there are hundreds of kinds of amino acids that chemistry can produce, but your body only produces 20 or 22. So why does it do that? Well, there's a particularly useful set, and being able to make those, just those molecules efficiency, efficiently is more useful than having you know, the full menu of 300 different available. So we think that any kind of life on Titan or you know, self-replicating molecules on Titan will be able to do the same thing. And so we think that if we see a signature of biology on Titan, it would be that there are particular types of molecules that are being made in an overabundance relative to what we would find if there weren't life there. So that's kind of what we're looking for. We're not looking for anything tremendously complex. We're just kind of looking for these chemical signatures of what that life might have been like. Right, the whole atmosphere is made of methane, right? This is the stuff that um, you, you, know, you run power plants off of. So would it explode? Uh, it would not because there's no oxygen on Titan. So if you wanted to build like a gas powered car on Titan, what you would do is you'd have a fuel tank full of oxygen that you'd burn with the methane in the air around it to make it go. So everything's kind of backwards there. Um, and if we really needed funding, we'd, we'd tell Exxon about all the, all, the, all the natural gas that's been discovered on Titan. But um, it would cost way more to bring it back um, than it would be worth. But everything's sort of backwards there. So you wouldn't have any chance of setting it all on fire because there's not enough oxygen to burn with the methane. Okay, so the question is, how do we anticipate dealing with corrosive materials? Um, the temperatures there are really low, and so the chemical processes don't proceed very fast. Um, the kind of chemicals we expect to see uh, are probably going to be in relatively low abundance um, and are probably not going to build up within the vehicle. So we don't expect to be acquiring corrosive materials from the environment. Um, but there's always a danger that there's something we didn't think about um, and something could happen. So you know, dealing with the probabilities and how much you can plan for, there's always a scenario that you can't plan for. And so we don't expect to be seeing any issue from corrosive chemicals, uh, but we'll have to find out. Uh, Huygens was only there for half an hour before it, it ran out of battery, so we're gonna be there three and a half years. We'll have a much better chance to figure that kind of thing out. What happens if it dies? Well, all rovers die at some time. So uh, what is going to kill us? Um, eventually, the uh, decay of the plutonium-238, um, it has this half-life of 88 years, but eventually it will run down and we will freeze to death. The other chance is we might have a bad day and we might crash, um, and that might, be, that might be what ends our mission. So uh, those are maybe two of the likely scenarios, but the interesting thing is we don't have any consumables on board. It's not like we're gonna run out of fuel or anything. So as long as we still have power and we haven't you know, keeled over, we should be able to keep going. We could potentially run for many, many years um, before uh, the rover finally um, dies, which will eventually happen. Will eventually happen. What is my biggest technical concern? I would say, and the engineers won't like this, but my concern is that you know every landing you're taking a chance, okay? And even if every landing is 99% likely to work, if we do 50 landings you very well rapidly build up a 50% chance of failure. So my really biggest concern is to make every one of those landings extremely safe and extremely robust so that one small low probability event doesn't kill us. As far as other engineering problems, I'm, I mean, the thermal problem is really challenging. 
keeping the, you know, it's like the McDLT, okay? You want to keep the hot side hot and the cold side cold, and you want to keep it the right amount of hot and cold. Otherwise, uh, you know, you can really damage the battery or some of the electronics. Uh, a, a bucket of water out there? Lava. Lava. Well, um, lava on Earth, uh, you know, can remain liquid for a while, but not all that long, you know, hours. Um, it's much colder on Titan, um, but really it's the propagation speed of the heat inward that really limits how fast it would take. So it would probably take about hours on Titan as well. On Titan though, the lava is just water because the ground on Titan is made of water and the volcanoes on Titan are made of water. We call them cryovolcanoes. So real lava on Titan is just like a bucket of water on Earth. Um, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about. Yeah, no, yeah, great question. How does the water inside Titan not freeze? Well, the same way that Earth's core is actually quite hot, it's made of melted iron, and that's due to leftover heat from the formation of Earth, and radioactive decay keeps our inside of Earth hot, and then that gets cooler and cooler as you go out. And so the same thing is happening on Titan. If the interior of Titan we think is warm, and that heat slowly propagates out, um, and the surface is very cold, but the inside is slowly trying to cool off. And if you drill down, the further down you drill, the warmer it gets. And eventually, even starting at 90 Kelvin, so cold, eventually you drill down to a point where you get to liquid water and we have that liquid water ocean. And we don't know how far that is, but we hope that the seismometers really are real key to measure exactly the depth down to the ocean. Yeah, yeah so the question is, how much would a 170 pound person weigh on Titan? It's seven times lower gravity. So uh, let me put it another way, a thousand pound person would weigh, on Earth, would weigh 170 pounds on Titan. So a 170 pound person on Titan would weigh about 22 or 23 pounds. Uh, 170 pounds on Earth would be about 22 or 23 on Titan. Yeah, great question. So um, we do not, unlike on Mars, where there's all these communication satellites that beam amazing amounts of data home, we do not have that. We just have this single dish, it's about this big, okay, and it's sending the data a billion kilometers. Uh, and so our total amount of data is sort of like a 1980s modem. We're talking like 2000, 2048 baud. Um, we'll have about a, an eight hour uplink pass, or roughly once per Earth day. Uh, and so the total amount of data we expect to get is about a CD worth, maybe about a gigabyte worth per Earth year. So it's not that much compared to what we get from um, rovers on Mars, but we have very advanced um, you know, compression algorithms to try to maximize the data we have. And although uplinking that data is very expensive, storing it is cheap, right? You can buy a, a, a chip the size of my pinky fingernail that'll, that'll store 100 gigabytes. So we're gonna store all the pictures we take for the whole mission, all the data we take, we're gonna store it on board. So at any point, if we go, want to go back and say, you know, we never uplinked that picture from that site. Let's go back and do that. It will be there. We can always uplink it. Um, it just takes a while. So uh, the question is about Mars sample return. The next step of Mars exploration is to go down to the surface of Mars, pick up rocks, bring them back to orbit around Mars, and eventually get them back to Earth. How hard would that be at Titan? Well, the big challenge at Titan is the atmosphere. Okay, flying a rocket through that atmosphere is very expensive. On Mars, they're planning on having a rocket. They're going to have sideways. Uh, and it'll be a solid fuel rocket. What they're gonna do is they're gonna toss it up in the air, ping, and then they're gonna light it, and it's gonna take off, okay? So you really can't do that on Titan. I have thought, it's crazy, I shouldn't admit it, but I have thought about how you might do a Titan sample return. I think you'd wanna use an airplane. You wanna use an electrically powered airplane to use that air to your advantage, get you up above most of the atmosphere, and then light a rocket to get into orbit and bring it home. So it would be probably more challenging than Mars, but for different reasons. It was, it was a quadcopter. In fact, I, I assumed it would be quadcopter with the um, 90 degree apart rotors. And so it was the engineers that came up with this design where there's like a candy bar down the middle that is most of the electronics. And then rotors on the sides that are not at a 90 degree angle, they're sort of at a very tight angle relative to one another. And that's actually how we came up with the name Dragonfly. Um, my colleagues and I were on a field trip in the desert, uh, the Sahara Desert in Morocco, trying to come up with a name for the mission. And we like wanted to call it, I don't know if it would be like Amelia Earhart. I mean, maybe it's better to name it after a dead woman than a dead old white guy. I mean, trying to think of something new. Um, I wanted to name it, I wanted to name it Mosquito, because it's gonna like land on the surface and suck material up and sample it. And no one liked that for some reason. So 
Once we got back and saw this design where the two wings are not 90 degrees apart, but they're near each other, when you look at it from above, it kind of does look like a, drag, a set of dragonfly wings. And so that's how, how that uh, all developed. What elements are in the chemical battery? So that is a lithium ion battery, similar to um, those in an electric car you would have on Earth. Uh, they are space grade um, batteries that have been tested uh, in these kinds of environments. But it's a lithium ion battery, so it's the best rechargeable batteries we have. Um, but even then, the size of the battery is, is going to be maybe 8 kilowatt hours, or about 10 times less than that in a Tesla. So we can't have a giant fat battery, but we, can, we, we do have a, a lithium ion battery. Okay, what frequency are we using to beam data home? It is X band radio waves that I think are about three or four centimeters in length. Um, NASA likes you to use shorter wavelengths, but the problem is those get absorbed by the atmosphere, so we actually need the longer wavelength so it will penetrate through the atmosphere uh, and we can maximize our bandwidth down to Earth. Particularly, for instance, um, near sunrise and sunset, of course, the Earth is very close to the sun as seen from Titan. So if you're looking through a lot of air down this way, trying to see, trying to communicate to Earth when Earth is very low on the, near the horizon, you really need those longer wavelengths to be able to get um, enough, enough uh, of the signal through the atmosphere to transmit a significant amount of data. Yeah, yeah so if it's night on Titan, you're looking through the moon, what would you see? Well, just like when you look out, when you look down into Titan, you can't see through all the haze and smoke down to the surface. You can't really see out of that haze and smoke either. So sometimes you'll see a very artistic picture of Dragonfly with Saturn beautifully in the background. No, no, you can't. You wouldn't be able to see through the atmosphere. So it would be sort of like an overcast day on Earth. So the, uh, even during the day, the light, you wouldn't really be able to see the sun. The, sun, the sunlight would be uh, scattered through all of the different um, haze. You wouldn't, you'd see it more like a, a, an overcast day than a, than a sunny day on Earth. Um, okay, so well, the question is, uh, what is the landing gear made of? You know, we just changed the landing gear, so I'm not entirely certain. Um, I think it's also made out of aluminum, but we just switched to this um, fixed landing gear um, that sort of tilts inward like this so that it can actually meet up with the curve of the heat shield that's on the inside. And so I think that is also aluminum, but um, that's a great question. I don't quite, I can't be 100% certain. Yeah, so the question is, what's the percentage of men and women on the team? Um, we are very proud of the fact that we have 40% women on our science team. We have the first woman that's a principal investigator of a mission this big, of a New Frontiers class mission. The highest other planetary mission, the fraction of women, was 15%. So we, I think, have done very well. Uh, and we actually we didn't even have to try that hard. Um, we tried to come up with people. We came up with a list, and by the time our science team had 20 people on it, it actually was, was even 10 and 10. And as we grew up to about 35 or 36, that ratio grew a little bit. Um, but we are um, nearing parity and nearing the amount of fraction of women that are actually you know, young scientists in the field. Um, and that's something that we're very, uh, we're very proud of uh, and something that we'd like to continue propagating uh, as we get new scientists and bring them in. We're trying to achieve that, um, a similar balance on those as well. Yeah. Um, the question is, so do you get different perspectives and views from that? Um, you know, I, I was on the Cassini mission, but I was on the Cassini mission when, uh, very late in the process. So the science team for Cassini was selected in 1989 when I was in junior high school, so I couldn't apply, okay? So by the time I got there, I, you know, the young people don't really get to get the sense for what those, those team dynamics were, but Cassini was a very different, uh, different spacecraft by design. Um, this mission is what's called a competed mission. It was one that we decided and we proposed to NASA. Cassini was a mission that, that uh, NASA developed and brought people into, so the, the, there were very different dynamics, I can tell you that for sure, but it's difficult, I think, for me to attribute, I, I think most of those dynamics are not due to the people or the composition of people, but rather due to the organizational structure, um, but it's a really interesting topic. In fact, so interesting uh, that there's a woman named Janet Vertesi who studies us and how we design these things. So not only are we science purveyors, but we're also subjects where she's like in there writing notes like, wow, these people are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but she studies exactly these kind of dynamics and she's looking for these kind of effects. So maybe we'll be able to learn more about that in the future. Yeah, isn't that crazy? Okay, so um, it turns out the pressure at the bottom of that ocean, that ocean might be hundreds of kilometers thick, such that the pressure at the bottom there is hundreds of bars, much more than it is at the bottom of Earth's ocean. 
And it turns out that there's a form of ice called ice six that doesn't form snowflakes in this hexagonal structure, but rather has a much tighter um, crystal structure that is denser than water and so can be at the bottom. It's kind of a crazy thing to think about. But in these very um, big ice moons with thick water crusts, we think it's sort of like a water sandwich between ice bread on the top and the bottom. But it's very different ice at the bottom, this, this high pressure form of ice um, and not the, the ice that we're all familiar with. Great question. So yeah, is there a question, is there a possibility that the, the sand there or the dust is made of ice? You know, that's what we all assumed. They're like, on Earth, you grind up rocks, you make sand. On Titan, the ground is made of ice. You grind it up, you make sand, right? And so we all, I, I assumed that at first. But um, my instrument, the Visual and Infrared Mapping Spectrometer, looks at the uh, reflection spectrum, and it's not consistent with ice. And the radar instrument is able to measure composition via uh, the uh, electrical properties that it measures in the surface. And those are, once again, not consistent with ice, and they are consistent with organics. So this is like actually a big surprise to me personally. Uh, I assumed there would be ice sand if there was sand, but the data seem to suggest that it's made of organics instead, and that's a surprise to me as much as anybody. So how do we discover the waves on Titan? Um, I actually was looking at specular reflections. Let me see if I have an example of these. I think I have, here we go, okay. So, oh here, yeah, I can see some waves right here. All right, so this is a sun glint off of the off of Titan. So it turns out after a while, we started looking back and you look at sort of the dark side of Titan, and there's a glint off of the lake. And so this glint right here is really tight. It's showing you that the waves there are actually, uh, it's perfectly flat for within millimeters. But now, if you look at this thing over here, there's a little, a little orange blob, okay? This is an area that we know is liquid because we've seen it on other flybys. And what's happening is that liquid is a, a rough surface that reflects that sunlight at different angles. And so like when you look at the ocean, you can see a wide um, glint from the sun. That's because of the waves on the surface. The width is dependent on how rough the surface is and how many waves there are. So we use um, these sun glints to be able to measure where and how big the waves are. And that's how we were able to find the waves on Titan. All right, Roxanne's cutting us off, I think. Thank you so much for your curiosity tonight. This is obviously um, the right person to bring to the stage today. Thank you so much, Dr. Barnes, for being here and answering these questions and going through these presentations. Such an important thing that you're doing. Thank yep. you so much. All right, for all right, thanks for coming.